<clears throat> Welcome to CNAP's webinar series. Its purpose is to provide patients and caregivers with up-to-date knowledge on topics of interest to the community. Please let us know if you have topics you'd like to see covered in the series. My name is Barbara Duffield and I serve on the CNET's board and as well I'm a co-leader of the Victoria Support Group. Today we're happy to welcome Dr. Jadira Del Rivero to speak with us. Some of you probably remember her from our conference in May where she spoke a couple of times. She is with the U.S. National, National Cancer Institute, the National Institute of Health, uh, Center for Cancer Research. Her areas of expertise include endocrine oncology and rare tumors, and she's the principal investigator of the Natural History Study for Neuroendocrine Neoplasm and Adrenocortical Cancers to provide the basis for further development of therapeutic interventions, prevention screening guidelines, endpoints for future clinical trials, and patient-reported outcome measures. Dr. Rivera's current focus is the development of novel treatment approaches and targeted therapies for endocrine malignancies such as advanced gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, adrenocortical cancer, and pheochromocytoma paraganglia. Today, Dr. Del Riviera will speak on the topic of symptomatic management of functional nets. This is a topic we often hear about in our support group meetings. And as well, I want to point out that there'll be a question and answer at the end of our talk. Um, so you can save your questions and either post them or verbally um, express them at that point in time. So I welcome Dr. Del Riviera for her talk. Thank you so much uh, for the kind introduction. And it's a pleasure for me to be with you today and discuss about symptom management for functional neuroendocrine tumors. And again, thank you. I mean, it's my pleasure you know, to be with patients and empower patients and uh, that living with this condition and of course, their caregivers as well. Okay. Um, so, Let's just discuss about what means by functional or non-functional neuroendocrine tumors. Um, as we can see, it could be either of them. It could be functional or non-functional, depending on the hormone secretion. Functional neuroendocrine tumors produce excess hormones, and depending on what hormone uh, the neuroendocrine tumor produces, there is a specific uh, series of signs and symptoms. Non-functional neuroendocrine tumors do not produce hormones or enough of them to cause any symptoms. As you know, neuroendocrine tumors can be anywhere in the body, but most commonly are found in the gastrointestinal tract, pancreas, and lungs. But as we can see here, there is a figure here. I hope you can see my cursor, but there is a figure here. Uh, where uh, I'm listing some of the most common neuroendocrine tumors in different parts of the body, including the thyroid. Um, uh, thyroid uh, there is a type of thyroid neuroendocrine tumor it's called medullary thyroid cancer, and they can produce calcitonin, and the excess of calcitonin can produce different symptoms. Lunt neuroendocrine tumors, or thymic neuroendocrine tumors, can also produce a series of hormones or peptides. Uh, they can produce serotonin, but they can also produce other hormones as well. And we're going to discuss a little bit about that and how do we manage this excess of hormone. Um, and pancreas, pancreas neuroendocrine tumors has quite a few hormones. Um, and uh, as we can see here, they're listed here. The hormones that the pancreas can produce is either gastrin or insulin or glucagon or vasoactive intestinal polypeptide or somatostatin. And I know that I'm saying a lot of words right now, but I'm going to go through each one of them, what symptoms um, these uh, functional neuroendocrine tumors produce and what is the management. And the small intestine neuroendocrine tumors, they, they can produce serotonin, and because it's excess of serotonin, can also cause carcinoid syndrome, and we're going to talk uh, uh, about that as well. Uh, there is the more rare neuroendocrine tumors in the adrenal gland, and that's called pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. They can also produce hormones as well, and the specific hormones that can also cause as well very specific uh, symptoms as well. 
In terms of the clinical presentation of neuroendocrine tumors that we discussed, functional uh, neuroendocrine tumors produce hormones and they can cause symptoms. And sometimes in those situations, we can also uh, diagnose earlier. But the majority of the neuroendocrine tumors are non-functional and sometimes they have non-specific symptoms. And it can mimic a variety of disorders as well. Um, it can also be uh, um, mimic, like for example, irritable bowel syndrome. And a lot of the patients are misdiagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome. But in non-functional neuroendocrine tumors, because of these non-specific symptoms, the, the, there is a delay in diagnosis. And by the time we diagnose a patient with neuroendocrine tumors are in more advanced stages. But in terms of the non-specific symptoms related to neuroendocrine tumors, we have abdominal pain, weight loss, sometimes it could be an obstruction as well as the small bowel. It can also cause nausea and bleeding. So those are the symptoms, but again, the purpose of discussing today will be the functional neuroendocrine tumors and how we can discuss. But it's important to also acknowledge that majority of neuroendocrine tumors are non-functional and those symptoms are, can mimic a variety of disorders and that's in the layer of diagnosis. And that's why we need to do better as well in diagnosing patients with neuroendocrine tumors. Now, in terms of the functional neuroendocrine tumors, this is a, 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 a table here, um, and we're going to go over each one of them. Uh, carcinoid syndrome, as we discussed earlier, is more commonly associated with small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, as well as lung neuroendocrine tumors as well. The hormone that uh, produces serotonin, and these are the symptoms associated with the excess of serotonin, which can be diarrhea, it could be flushing, it can also be heart failure, and we're going to talk about that. Um, in terms of the pancreas neuroendocrine tumors that we discussed, we have here insulin. Um, just a little bit of explaining what insulin does. Insulin lowers the blood glucose, uh, and if you have excess of insulin, your blood, blood, blood glucose can be quite low. Gastrinoma produce gastrin, and what is gastrin? Gastrin is a hormone that um, help uh, release ex uh, acid in the stomach. So if you have an excess of gastrin, you're going to have an excess of acid in the stomach to produce uh, gastric acids. And because of that, that can also cause ulcers, uh, diarrhea as well. And that the series of sudden signs and symptoms related to gastrinoma is called Sollinger-Ellison syndrome. Uh, BIPoma or BIP. Uh, the name of the BIP is called vasoactive intestinal polypeptide. So this is a more rare pancreas neuroendocrine tumors and BIP is responsible to also help uh, uh, metabolize, mobilize electrolytes and water as well in the body. And sometimes when there is an excess of BIP that can also cause excess of diarrhea and losing a lot of electrolytes. And we're going to discuss about that glucagonoma, what is the hormone that glucagonoma produces, glucagon. And again, these are the more rare types of functional neuroendocrine tumors. And, and glucagon can also inhibit insulin as well. And because of that, that can also cause diabetes. Uh, it can also um, uh, in, inhibit some of the fatty acids, so it doesn't metabolize uh, well the fatty acids. And because of that, uh, patients with glucagonoma can't, uh, uh, can't um, lost muscle mass, as well as a rash, a very specific rash uh, associated with glucagonoma, somatostatinoma. And, and again, this is a very complex name. Uh, and that's the hormone that, that uh, this tumor produces, somatostatin. These are very rare, very rare, but somatostatin inhibit a lot of uh, gut hormones. And because of that, there is bile stones and uh, increased uh, fat excretion in the stools, and it can also cause diabetes. So those are the symptoms associated with some of these hormone excess. We're going to discuss a little bit about thoracic neuroendocrine tumors and what most commonly hormones they can produce. And we're going to discuss a little bit about pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. Um, now, in terms of the functional neuroendocrine tumors, there's two things that we need to understand is what do we need to do in order to control the symptoms and what do we need to do in order to control the tumor growth? And we're going to discuss a little bit about that. And here we have quite a few tools now uh, for the management of the functional neuroendocrine tumors, as well as to uh, slow down the growth of the tumors as well. But the, the sequencing is something that we still need to understand more about the net expert. Uh, and that's the reason why the management of neuroendocrine tumors is quite 
personalized from patient to patient, depending on how many tumors are found in the body, uh, whether it's in, only in the liver and other parts outside the liver, whether they express a somatostatin receptor. Um, and because they express somatostatin receptors, we can do a scan, a very specific scan, and more than 80% of patients of, with neuroendocrine tumors express that receptor. And it's important to know that because that can also help us understand who may benefit uh, uh, with Lutathera. Uh, we also need to understand, as I say, whether they produce hormones or not, because depending on that, we can then manage not only uh, the control of tumor growth, but as well as control the symptoms as well. So as we can see, we have, we have quite a few tools in our toolbox, but it's important to understand when uh, we need to use each one of them. And again, it's very personalized from patient to patient. And that's the reason why we usually advise to see somebody who has expertise in neuroendocrine tumors to then guide what we think could be one of the best uh, therapy for patients living with neuroendocrine tumors. And we're going to discuss a little bit about the different therapies as well. Now let's discuss about the gastrointestinal strong, uh, neuroendocrine tumors. Um, so more than 90% of patients with carcinoid syndrome have metastatic disease, meaning that they involve uh, as well tumors in the liver and uh, with primary tumors either in the distal small intestine or as well as the proximal colon. And we're going to discuss a little bit about that. Now, this excess of serotonin uh, can cause what we call a carcinoid syndrome. And the most common symptoms associated with carcinoid syndrome is flushing. Uh, it can also be diarrhea, and sometimes the diarrhea can be quite debilitating. Uh, this excess of serotonin can also accumulate in the heart valves. Uh, and because of that, that causes scar tissue in the heart valve and that can also cause heart failure and sometimes patients need to uh, undergo uh, valve replacement. This is why it's important that patients that have uh, carcinoid syndrome, they can they also see a cardiologist as well on a regular basis uh, to also prevent complications related to what we call carcinoid heart disease. And I'm sure, you know, uh, uh, CNS will have more information about that, but that's something that we need to understand and also understand how to manage patients with carcinoid heart disease. Um, other symptoms are um, as well sometimes difficult to breathe in, um, and uh, other symptoms will be as well fatigue. Um, so, and also like joint pain that can also uh, uh, be associated with carcinoid syndrome. I think the most important is highlighted here in red is. Uh, uh, diarrhea, shortness of breath, flushing, and again, it can also affect the heart. I know that you understand about the Phi E, so the Phi E stands for epinephrine, eating, uh, is meaning that there are certain food that can exacerbate the symptoms related to carcinoid syndrome. Epinephrine is usually whenever you see a dentist and they need to do an intervention and sometimes they give you a, a shot of epinephrine, emotions, but you know, like a more intense type of emotion, alcohol, uh, and exercise, severe, more intense exercise. So I think what we know is that this, there's these five E's that can also cause these ex, uh, exacerbated symptoms related to uh, carcinoid syndrome. But that said, I think it's important also to understand what can you tolerate or not. Like for example, some patients may still want to enjoy like a glass of wine and that's okay. You measure yourself how it is. Sometimes some patients may give a little bit of short acting uh, injection uh, and then they have a glass of uh, wine. I think it's important to understand as well you know, what, how you body react to all of this, but at the same time, I don't want you to deprive of all of this. So I think it's important to understand how your body react. And then after that, we can advise in terms of the things that, you know, you can eat or not, or, or how much alcohol and so forth. Now, the treatment of excess of serotonin, we usually use this monthly injection. I'm sure you're familiar with this injections is either landriotide or octriotide. We call this somatostatin agonist. Like I say earlier, 80% of more of neuroendocrine tumors express somatostatin receptors. So that's why we, we wanna do this very special skin. Uh, and depending on the findings, then we also recommend therapy with Luthathera. But that said, you know, if you have 
a positive skin or thought that they skinned, um, then we can also make recommendations about this monthly injection. Majority, like I say here, the, of neuroendocrine tumors are positive on the skin. It's important to also understand that the, this monthly injection has two functions. One is control the tumor growth, as I say earlier, and another one is to control hormonal production. One question that I sometimes have from providers or sometimes from uh, patients as well, if that there is growth of tumors despite using this monthly injection, sometimes it's like, do we stop or do we continue? Now, if the tumor is functional, then we continue. But if it's non-functional, then we usually make the decision of not continuing. But that's also always we need to discuss with your provider as well. Um, so when the diarrhea is more severe, despite using this monthly injection, um, and another thing that I want to mention as well, sometimes uh, instead the injection is given every four weeks, but if we sometimes we give it every three weeks, that can also help because some patients start feeling that after the the three weeks they start feeling that the effect of these injections they start to wean off and that's why sometimes we recommend that instead of every three weeks uh, four weeks sorry then we do it every three weeks and that sometimes help for the symptoms but despite having all this intervention and still the diarrhea is severe here in the United States, we have a medication called Telotristat. I don't know if that's something available in Canada. I know that they're trying to add this on their formulary in Canada, uh, but this medication can help uh, also to control the diarrhea, and that's the indication as well. This medication is to uh, control the symptoms of uh, diarrhea related uh, to carcinoid syndrome. And, and, and how, why we recommend this, and I always uh, tell my patients, you know, we always need to ask your provider why they're recommending each intervention, why not and why, and always to understand. I usually tell my patients knowledge is power. So the more you understand about your tumor, the more you understand about uh, what treatments you have available, then you can have a more of conscious decisions as well of your uh, disease. But this medication, as we can see here, the lottery stat, just to guide you a little bit. So these are the uh, the levels of 5-HIAA. So serotonin, uh, we measure the serotonin via 5-HIAA. And it's usually a 24-hour urine collection. There is a blood collection as well. It's only one time, but that's not available in every institution. I don't think it's available in Canada. In the United States, it's available in, at the Mayo Clinic. And I, I, but there is uh, another test that is only a blood test. I think it's better for patients right and to collect at 24 hours, but we're trying to make that accessible as well for all patients. But as you can see here, the FIHIAA, these are the negative numbers. So the more negative, the more the medication is lowering the, this excess of serotonin and FIHIAA. And as we can see here, this medication is known to lower the level of FIHIAA. This medication, what it does, it blocks an enzyme that converts another compound to serotonin. So that's kind of like something, that's the reason why with this medication can be used for patients that have severe diarrhea despite using injections or anti-diarrhea medications and so forth. But also this medication, what they found as well, uh, is that that can also decrease the number of diarrheas per day. And as we can see, this is the number of diarrhea, the, the number of bowel movements, my apologies. And, and we can see that this medication can also decrease the number of uh, the uh, bowel uh, movements as well. And because of that, you know, this medication is indicated. Again, I don't know if it's available in Canada, but I know that they're trying to work on the formulary for this to, to be accessible for patients that have refractory diarrhea. Now, there are other options. Like I say earlier, we have tools within our toolbox. It's just to understand when do we need to use each of one of these tools. Uh, in patients with a, a neuroendocrine tumors or small bowel neuroendocrine tumors that have liver metastasis, and we know that that's usually where they like to go, uh, these neuroendocrine tumors. Um, so surgery sometimes can be indicated. We know that the, that if uh, from prior uh, studies and as well from uh, expert surgeon uh, as well, uh, Dr. Halle is, on, is one of the expert surgeons in Canada as well. We know that uh, if uh, the 
if we are able to, if the surgeon is able to resect more than 75% of the whole volume of tumors, we know that that help patients, but also at the same time, if you're able to uh, resect some of these tumors, that can also help as well to reduce the hormones too. We discuss about the monthly injection. Sometimes patients can benefit what we call liver directed therapy and that's usually the uh, job of the interventional radiologist. The interventional radiologist is the one that does this type of intervention. There is a different type of embolization. The one that we usually uh, recommend is plant embolization. So there's three types of embolization. One is chemoembolization where you give chemotherapy. The other one is radioembolization. We usually don't recommend that for neuroendocrine tumors, but I think it's also depend on the expertise of the interventional radiologist. And then we have plant embolization, and that's the one that we usually recommend. We discuss about Luthathera or 177 addition dotate. So that's another treatment as well that can help for tumor controls as well as symptoms. There are chemotherapy options as well. I'm sure some of you have heard about Captain, Capsidabin, Temasolomide. I know my understanding is that that's also available in Canada too, uh, and that's used in patients with pancreas near endocrine tumors. Uh, and then we have another drug called everolimus. So everolimus is, is another uh, medication that is being used for neuroendocrine tumors that can also help uh, to control tumor growth as well as uh, hormone secretion. And just to let you know, in the United States, there is a, um, a clinical study, and we hope that they can be available as well for other parts of the part of the, in other countries, and other part of the world as well, but this is a medication called palsutocin uh, for patients that have carcinoid syndrome. And this is a pill. It's a pill that is given. Um, so it's, it's currently a phase two study, meaning that they're trying to understand the efficacy of the drug. So that's what the phase two study is, and also understand more of the side effects. Um, and there is a pill that is given as well, and it seems some patients, they're tolerating it, and I think we need to understand whether that can also add uh, to another drug that can be added to our toolbox of different therapies. Um, and um, again, this is available in the United States. I do believe that Canadian patients can also participate, but if any information, I'm happy to, after this talk, if you want to ask me about that, I can definitely help you to find that information. So in terms of the carcinoid syndrome, and again, just to summarize a little bit, patients with a small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, they can, uh, they can produce this excess of serotonin. This excess of serotonin can cause symptoms called carcinoid syndrome. The way we measure this excess of serotonin is via urine test, which is the PHIAA. Uh, but, and as we can see here, serotonin overproduction is a driver of carcinoid syndrome. Um, and we know that this serotonin has demonstrated to have some effect on growth of the tumor. Uh, and this excess of serotonin, as we discussed, can cause carcinoid heart disease. As we discussed, this is kind of like a scar tissue forming on the heart valves. Uh, it can also cause mesenteric fibrosis. And that means that there is also a scar tissue in the lining of the stomach, and that can also cause some obstruction. So that's something that we need to understand as well and, and monitor as well. Um, and also, this, this uh, um, is important to control the excess of serotonin just because it, that can also improve quality of life in patients and, and patients with carcinoid syndrome as well. And we discuss the different tools that uh, we recommend in order to uh, manage the excess of this hormone. Now, let's discuss a little bit about pancreas neuroendocrine tumors. Um, so pancreas neuroendocrine tumors we discuss here, um, most common uh, insulinoma, gastrinomas, BIPOMA, uh, glucagonoma, and somatostatinomas. Um, so we're going to discuss a little bit more about that, but this is just a reminder of what I discussed earlier today. So what are the symptoms of insulinoma? And uh, what insulinoma is? Insulinoma, as we discussed earlier, is excess of insulin. Insulin is responsible to lower uh, your blood uh, glucose. And if you have this excess of insulin, it's going to lower your blood glucose even more. 
the symptoms in insulinoma is, is, is we can see there's many symptoms. You can feel a little shaky, your heart rate can go fast, sweating, feeling dizzy, feeling anxious, feeling very hungry. Sometimes it can be more severe symptoms like blurry vision, headaches, very, being very irritable, fatigue. Um, but the the symptoms of insulinoma, like I discussed, is hypoglycemia when the blood glucose is less than 50, when you have the hypoglycemia symptoms that I already discussed, and when it's relieved by the administration of, of glucose. We call that Whipple trias, but I don't want you to confuse with any of that. But basically, that I just wanted to understand what are the symptoms of insulinoma, so that way we can learn about that. And um, in terms of how do we manage insulinoma, um, sur surgery is a choice of insulinoma. There are insulinomas that are very, very small, and because of that, we can also diagnose earlier, and surgery is curative in those situations. Uh, but sometimes these insulinomas can metastasize, can go to other places in the body, and then we also need to advise patients how do we manage these symptoms of uh, insulinomas as well as the tumor growth. Um, Patients that have this insulinoma, sometimes we need to recommend having small meals um, and, um, and continuous oral glucose as well. Sometimes they need to be in the hospital in order to receive IV glucose, but that's something that, you know, we usually recommend those for those patients that um, have insulinoma, more advanced insulinoma. Like I say, what is localized, we, uh, we when it's in earliest days, we localize and the symptoms go away. But like I say, sometimes these insulinomas can be found in other places. And because of that, we need to have different measurements as well. And that's usually what we recommend, small meals, continuous oral glucose uptake. And sometimes they need to be, go to the hospital and have IV, depending on the symptoms and how low the glucose is. There is a medication called diaxoside. Uh, this medication inhibits the insulin secretion at the cellular level, uh, and it's a, a, a common a medication that um, is used in these situations and is available in Canada. Um, so this medication, I, I, there was a, 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 a patient and a, a provider that called me that um, that there was a confusion if dioxide can interfere with the skin. They thought that the scan is not, but I just want to clarify that. Um, and um, as we discuss other other medications that we can use, ultratyolandria, those are the monthly injections. There's all the medications like verapamilophenitoin, those are anti-seizure medication. We don't understand why they help to control some of the symptoms of insulinoma, but that can help as well. Um, so in patients that had more uh, advanced disease, when they have metastasis in the liver and so forth. There are other drugs that we can, uh, we could recommend as well. There is a medication usually used in Europe, not even in the United States, it's called Pasiriotai. I think there has been some studies and it's very similar, Pasiriotai is very similar to uh, Landriotai or Sandostatin, so we call that somatostatin agonist, but we don't use it in the United States. Um, I know that they're used in Europe. Um, I didn't, I couldn't, uh, I think Canada is not available, but that's something that has been used and sometimes that can help. I think in refractory cases, maybe something to consider. We also have medications as well, systemic therapies that we could recommend because like I said, you, the, function, the, the goal of, uh, of therapy and patients have functional neuroendocrine tumors when it's metastasis, when have patient has metastasis is to control growth of tumors and to also control the symptoms. But sometimes by control, the uh, tumor growth that can also call, uh, help the symptoms as well. Um, and as we discussed, one of there is Everolimus and, um, and Sunitinib, and we're going to discuss about that. Um, there is a medication called Cabosantinib, um, and that was in a clinical trial. I believe Dr. Simrom in Canada has that study, which you, just recently closed and they found that there was a lot of activity in patients with neuroendocrine tumors and we are we're happy very excited to see these findings because that can also we we'll add another uh, tool to our toolbox and also we discuss about ablation embolization and prt can also be used in these situations now let's talk a little bit about gastrinomas uh, gas, we, what is gastrinoma so it's, it's a tumor that produces excess of gastrin what gastrin does is is, is uh, uh, 
um, uh, produce excess of uh, acid in the stomach. So that's what gastrin do, it stimulates some of the cells in the stomach to produce acid. Uh, so uh, we discussed some of the most common symptoms, can be diarrhea, can be ulcers. So some of the patients sometimes uh, they go to the emergency room because they have a perforated ulcer and that's something that um, we have seen in patients with gastrinoma. Uh, Every patient that has a history of gastrinoma also needs to be tested for MEN1 or M multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1. The most common symptoms is diarrhea, heartburn, weight loss. Um, so as we can understand, how do we treat this gastrinoma symptomatically is by giving anti-acid medications. And the most common that we use is the proton point inhibitors. Uh, the name of that is either omeprazole, pantoprazole, but it's very important to understand that there are high doses of this medication. Usually omeprazole in patients that have a little bit of heartburn not related to gastrinoma, sometimes once a day is what is recommended, but in patients that has a history of gastrinoma, we recommend higher doses and twice a day medication. Uh, when it's detected, surgery is usually the choice and is a curative option as well. But for those patients that have more advanced disease, we discuss the monthly injection, octreotide, landriotide. We also discuss liver direct therapies can be an option. Uh, surgery, as we discussed, even in the metastatic setting, if uh, with a net a expert nurse, net surgeon, as long as they're able to reset more than 75% of the whole uh, voluminous tumors that can also help patients, and systemic therapies that we discussed. Uh, now, um, VIPoma, another name for VIPoma is Bernard Morrison syndrome. Uh, VIP is a hormone that mobilizes the water as well as electrolytes in the body. These are the more rare type of neuroendocrine tumors. So these patients that have VIPoma, they have watery diarrhea, but very uh, volume is very large as well of watery diarrhea. Uh, because as I, as I discussed earlier, this hormone can also help mobilize some of the electrolytes. Patients can also have very low potassium, very low chloride as well. Those are the electrolytes and other symptoms associated with VIPoma, like nausea, vomiting, muscle cramps, and so forth. Because of the massive amount of fluid the patient with a pioma can suffer from, uh, we need to replete the fluids and electrolytes as well. And then uh, the monthly injection can help. Sometimes high doses of steroids can help in this situation and any other anti-motility medications, anti-diarrhea medication can help as well. And for patients that have more advanced disease, we already discussed the different systemic therapies as well. And glucagonoma, this is also very rare, uh, glucagonoma, the most common symptoms is weight loss, skin rash, a very specific skin rash is, is found in patients with glucagonoma. The glucagon also inhibits uh, insulin as well, and because of that, it can also cause diabetes. Uh, glucagon hormones can also mobilize some of the fatty acids in the, in the body as well, and because of that, you know, they can also lose a lot of muscle mass too. Uh, it can also cause chronic diarrhea, uh, and it can also, also cause clots, blood clots as well, uh, and other symptoms. And in this situation, patients with glucagonoma, we need to uh, help manage the diabetes, we need to give nutritional support in those situations because of the function that glucagon has on the fatty acids and sometimes infusion amino acids can help. And also these medications that we discussed, octreotide, landrite can also be helpful. Um, and if there is more advanced disease, we discuss the different options here, which is very similar to other tumors, the other neuroendocrine tumors that we just discussed. Somatostatinomas, even me, it's very difficult to pronounce somatostatinoma, is excess of somatostatin. And somatostatin inhibits quite a few hormones uh, in the gut too as well. It also inhibits or lower the insulin secretion and that can cause diabetes. It can also inhibit some of the bile sats and that can also cause cold stunt and diarrhea and, and uh, fattened stools. Um, usually these tumors, when it's localized or just we discuss is the most common um, is, is the curative in patients with somatostatinomas. Uh, and depending on what complications they may have diabetes, then we need to co control the diabetes and so forth. Management of advanced disease, we discuss different tools that we have in our toolbox, and it's very similar for any similar 
uh, for all near endocrine tumors as well that we just discussed. The monthly injection of your Tylandriotai, the liver directed therapies that we just discussed, surgery, uh, luthathera, and other systemic therapies that we just discussed, like everolimus or chemotherapy with capsidabine temozolomide or some sunitinib as well. Now, let's discuss about thoracic nets because I know that um, I'm running out of time, but let's discuss about thoracic nets. Uh, thoracic nets can also produce hormones, and the hormones that most commonly produce is either serotonin, uh, it can also cause carcinoid syndrome, and that can also, similarly to the small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, we discussed the symptoms earlier. Uh, thoracic neuroendocrine tumors can also cause other hormones that can cause flushing to or wheezing. So that's other hormones that are not necessarily serotonin related. And one thing about the thoracic neuroendocrine tumors is they can also produce another hormone, and it's called the ACTH. Um, ACTH stands for adrenocorticotropic uh, adreno, adreno, hormone. And let me explain to you what this is. And I, I know it's a very long name, but let me explain to you what it, what it is. So ACTH is produced by the pituitary gland, which we know is the gland that is in the brain. So if you want to know where the pituitary gland is, is, is if you do an imaginary line between the, your eyes exactly in the middle of the brain, that's where your pituitary gland sits. Um, and, uh, and it's the mother of all hormones. So they can, it produces a lot of hormones, well, different type of hormones that then sends the signal to different organs to then secrete hormones. And if this ACTH it sends the signal to the adrenal gland to produce cortisol. This excess of ACTH then cause excess of cortisol because it's stimulating the adrenal gland to keep producing cortisol. And cortisol can then cause Cushing's syndrome. And what is Cushing's syndrome? So Cushing's syndrome is a series of signs and symptoms. Uh, this excess of cortisol can cause hyperglycemia, meaning the uh, elevation of blood glucose, diabetes. It can also cause some irritability, Patients with Cushing syndrome, they have this very characteristic moon face, uh, red face as well. They can also have fat deposition in the abdomen, in the back of the neck as well. They can have this purple trial. In females, it can cause uh, 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 difficulty having menstrual periods as well as some uh, irsutism, meaning some hair in places that a female would not like to have, like the face, acne as well. So. Um, and also this uh, uh, excess of cortisol can also uh, uh, make a patient to be more susceptible to infections. And if there is any procedure that needs to be done a surgery, the excess of cortisol can also decrease healing too. Um, so as we can see, Cushing syndrome is an excess of cortisol because the tumor uh, the, bronch the bronchial neuroendocrine tumor can produce a hormone called ACTH that sends a signal to the adrenal gland to produce a lot, a lot of cortisol. And that's what it called Cushing's syndrome. Um, it's important in those situations when a patient has this type of symptoms that we need to block the excess of cortisol. It can be done uh, via medical management. So there are different drugs that can help block the excess of cortisol. Um, and they're mentioned here, like the conazole, methyrapont, mitotine. There are different drugs that can help uh, uh, block the excess of cortisol, but sometimes in some patients, they may, we need to remove the adrenal glands because even the tumor can still produce this ACTH. If you don't have the stimulus, if you don't have the adrenal gland, then the excess of cortisol will not be there. So that's one of the things that we always can be a, a, an option as well, and it's something that we need to discuss with your uh, treating physician as well. So this is a summary. So this is the symptom management because the, 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 the title of my talk is how do we manage uh, functional neuroendocrine tumors or symptom management related to hormone excess. And this is a summary. As we discussed earlier, uh, we need to, um, there is two, we, the interventions that we uh, recommend to our patients is, like I said, to control the symptoms related to the neuroendocrine tumor as well as the tumor growth. But sometimes it may not be the, the same type of medications, right? So we have the, the, the tools that we have in order to control tumor growth, but sometimes in order to control the symptoms, there are other things that we need to recommend to our patients. Um, 
as we discussed for patients with carcinoid syndrome, we discussed about the injections, we discussed about the telodrista that I believe uh, in Canada trying to get a medication there, but also if that's not available, there are other medications that we can use like the anti uh, anti-motility medication, anti-diarrhea medication, tinder of opium, that's another thing that can be used. We discussed patients with insulinoma and excess of the insulin lowering the blood glucose. We, we recommend frequent small meals and dioxoside, which this medication inhibit uh, the excess of insulin. We discussed about the BIPOMA. BIPOMA, this hormone causes a lot of diarrhea and loss of uh, and a lot of electrolytes, uh, loss of electrolytes. And because of that, we need to replete with fluids and electrolytes. There are other medications that can be used. Gastrinoma, excess of gastrin, which can also uh, uh, stimulate excess of acid in the stomach. And, there, and, and the medication that we use is the antiacid medications as well. Uh, glucagonomas, we discussed about that. It can uh, produce uh, this excess of glucagon is responsible for diabetes as well as um, uh, the uh, fatty acid as well distribution and, and mobilization too. And because of that, we need to give amino acids and fatty acids and also control the, the management of diarrhea. Somatostatin, the most common associated with that is the diabetes because somatostatin inhibits the insulin and because it inhibits the insulin cause the blood glucose to go high uh, and that we need to manage that. And in patients with lunt uh, or time make neuroendocrine tumors, the is, cortisol excess is the one that we need to manage as well. Um, so this is a summary of the uh, different, uh, of all neuroendocrine tumors. We discussed about small bowel, we discussed pancreas and thoracic neuroendocrine tumors. And these are the different systemic options. I showed this slide before. So I, like I said earlier, we have different uh, uh, tools within our toolbox. And, it's, and that's the reason why whenever um, we need to discuss about options, it's important that you discuss with your provider who is treating you for the neuroendocrine tumors. Also, you need to discuss uh, and um, with a net expert if possible. I know that a lot of patients doesn't have uh, that accessibility to have a net expert. Um, I can provide my services for any of you and I'll be with you and, 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 and help you as much as I can as well. Uh, I'm working in an institution that we don't uh, deal with insurance or so, uh, cost coverage, so I'm happy to help with any of you in order to provide some guidance. Uh, but like I say, in terms of the different tools in our toolbox that we discuss, surgery is an option, we discuss about the monthly injection, we discuss about liver-directed therapies, that can be an option, we also discuss about uh, Lutathera. So if those options are available in Canada, um, and uh, you have an excellent surgeon as well, like I discussed Dr. Halles, one of the surgeons that is a net surgeon expert. Uh, we also have uh, chemotherapies mainly for neuroendocrine tumors, and then we have other systemic therapies. But again, you need to discuss with your provider about the different options. In summary, uh, 10 to 30 percent of pancreas neuroendocrine tumors may uh, secrete hormones, and because of the excess of hormone can cause clinical symptoms. Uh, the small bowel neuroendocrine tumors may develop carcinoid syndrome and bronchial neuroendocrine tumors may develop cushion syndrome. And those are the things that we always need to keep in mind whenever we manage patients with neuroendocrine tumors. Always the hormones. So if you say, how do I know that I have this, you know, this excess of hormone? So it's important to recognize the symptoms, but it's also important to do either a blood test or a urine test. And that's what we call a biochemical assessment. Surgery is usually, when it's diagnosed earlier, surgery is, is usually the cornerstone of therapy and that's usually curative, but in patients with more advanced disease, it's still surgery can be an option as long as you discuss with your provider. We all, like I discussed earlier, we need additional treatments in order to control the hormone excess too. And in patients with more advanced or metastatic disease that we discussed, we have quite a, a, a few tools, like I said earlier. Now, I just want to take have five minutes uh, in order to discuss about pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. These are uh, uh, more uh, um, rare tumors, so the rarest of the neuroendocrine tumors. And uh, pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas is also, like I said, neuroendocrine tumors, and these tumors can produce excess of uh, catecholamines and metanephrines. And we're going to discuss uh, what is that. Pheochromocytoma is within the adrenal gland, um, and paragangliomas is outside the adrenal gland. 
And just to let you know for those patients what theochromocytoma is, so if the adrenal glands are on top of the kidney, and if you and if you kind of cut the adrenal gland in half, then you have two layers of the adrenal gland. The outer layer uh, is called, um, uh, it produces three different hormones, and one of them is cortisol. Remember that I talk about cortisol, but the inner part is called the methella, and that's responsible to produce uh, adrenaline. And then adrenaline is responsible for your fight and flight response. Paragangliomas are also nerve, but it's outside of the adrenal gland that could be anywhere from the neck all the way down to the pelvis. Um, and that's important to recognize as well. Uh, paragangliomas, like I say, could be from the neck down to the pelvis. Paragangliomas of the neck. Usually those a majority of the paragangliomas of the neck, they're non-functional. There are very few may be functional, and we discuss what is functional versus non-functional. Um, in paragangliomas of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, uh, they can produce a secrete hormones as well. And the pheochromocytomas, which are in the adrenal glands, they can also produce hormones as well. So again, just to summarize, uh, pheochromocytomas in the adrenal gland, paragangliomas is outside the adrenal gland, paragangliomas of the neck, most of the time they're non-functional, paragangliomas of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis that are functional. So, and these are the different clinical symptoms. It's your fight and flight response. So, what is the symptoms associated with this excess of serotonin? High blood pressure is one of them. Um, or palpitations, sweating, headache, feeling anxious. Um, and paragangliomas and pheochromocytoma, they're called the great mimic. And the reason why is because it has so many symptoms, but they're non-specific. And sometimes patients are misdiagnosed having menopause or having anxiety or having panic attacks and so forth. And, and panic attack is one of the symptoms as well. But that's something that is a lot of the uh, patients with pheochromocytoma and paraganglimas are uh, diagnosed late. But let me just explain to you why it's important to uh, know about pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas and why medications are also important to control the symptoms. So as we can see here, we focus here, there is, this is a pheochromocytoma cell. This pheochromocytoma cell produces excess of uh, adrenaline. So this excess of adrenaline, which is measured in form of metanephrines in either in the urine in the, or in the blood. So this excess of uh, metanephrines, they release from the FIO cell and it goes to the blood vessel. And here is your blood vessel. So in this excess of hormones binds to receptors in the blood vessel and it's called the alpha receptors as we can see here. And these receptors are responsible to constrict the blood vessels. So as you can understand, this excess of hormones that binds to this receptor to cause uh, what we call vasoconstriction of constriction to the blood vessels is responsible for all of the symptoms like high blood pressure, uh, palpitations, and so forth. So whenever we give medications, we need to give medications that block that. And those are called doxazosint, or phenoxybenzamine, or prasocine, or terasocin, and that's available. The phenoxybenzamine may not be available in Canada, but the other drugs are available in Canada. So that's the reason why a patient with pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas that produce this excess of hormone is important to block those receptors called APA blockers. And um, how do we diagnose a patient with pheopana? We say blood tests or urine tests. It's important that you discuss with, with your uh, physician as well. We measure what we call the pre, pre, uh, plasma-free metanephrines. And it's important to also know uh, whenever you do a blood test that your doctor knows what other medications you are taking because there is some medications that may uh, cause a false elevation of these hormones. So perigangliomas, it can be like a volcano. So this excess of hormones is sometimes a lot more in, internally than when it's measured in the blood, and that can cause a series of episodes called storm attacks or spells. This excess of hormones can cause sinus tachycardia, meaning increase on in the heart rate, can also cause uh, cerebral bleeding because of the very elevated blood pressure. It can also cause severe constipation as well. Uh, and as we discussed about having alpha blockers as the first line of therapy, always, always alpha blocker. Um, and that's the medications that you need to start. And then after that, then, um, then you can add beta blocker, but that's after. And if you allow me to go back to the, this picture, 
And then that's why it's important if there is any provider here that is treating a patient with pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. The reason why we don't give a beta blocker, and even though some of these blood pressure medications are called uh, are named also beta blocker, the reason why we don't give beta blocker first is because if you block the beta blocker, there's going to be a lot more alpha, and that means a lot more vasoconstriction, a lot more high blood pressure, and so forth. So that's the reason why you first do the alpha blocker, and then after that, then you do the beta blockers, which help to, for the symptoms as well. But that's later, once we alpha blocker is on board. If the blood pressure is not well controlled, then we have the calcium channel blockers as well. Uh, we have uh, another a medication that is called uh, methyrosine that kind of like that also blocks the secretion of uh, met metanephrines. Uh, in Canada, uh, you have all these medications available, alpha blocker, maybe phenoxybenzamine will be a little harder to get. You have beta blockers too, and then you have what we call amlodipine or nifedipine that's available. Methyrosine is not something that is widely available, but that is not something that we use very often. So I think we use it in those very extreme situations that where we try to use a lot of these, um, um, when we try, we, we, when we use all of these drugs and still the blood pressure is not controlled, or the symptoms is not controlled, that's when we try to get methyrosine. One thing for the physicians or for the provider who is here, there is always uh, uh, there's a, a medication called lavetolol, and they have alpha and beta. And we and some physicians say, oh, we can give, you know, two in one pill. But the reality is that the alpha is very weak, and then you have more beta, and that's why we don't recommend lavetolol in those situations, uh, unless the alpha blocker is on board. There is different therapies for uh, the management of advanced disease. Uh, we're, the, today is not a talk about pheopara, and uh, maybe in another time we can discuss about the different uh, therapies for uh, available for metastatic pheochromocytomas and paracangliomas. But the most important thing or the message that I want you to take home is that is in terms of how do we manage the hormone excess. And we manage the hormone excess by giving medications, alpha blockers, and other medications as well uh, that we use in order to control the blood pressure. And it's always important that that is always on board before any surgery, before any systemic therapy, before any uh, uh, um, ablation or embolization, or a, even luthothera, because we know that luthothera is an option for as well for uh, pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. And with that, you know. As I discussed earlier, this is a summary, first-line therapy, alpha blockers. After alpha blockers, then we can add the beta blockers in, uh, in other medications. And as I say, beta adrenergic blockers should never be started first. And we discuss about different systemic therapy in those patients with more advanced disease, chemotherapy, uh, uh, radionuclide therapy, luthothera, and so forth. Um, and, again, and again, very important that it, is, it needs to be given after alpha block a adequate alpha blocker because sometimes when we give these systemic therapies that can call lysis meaning killing the PO cells and that release a lot of hormones and if you don't have enough of this alpha blocker that we discussed earlier that can also cause a lot of complications and with that I would like to thank you for your attention I would like to thank CNET for the opportunity to allow me to be with you today this is my email, um, my phone number. So it's important if you want to get in touch with me, just uh, use the direct phone number and I'm here for you. Anything you need, I want to help you. Like I said earlier, knowledge is power and I'm here to answer any questions as well. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. That was a phenomenal amount of information coming and um, I, I'm sort of in awe of it all. And we will have this posted on the CNET site so that people can review parts of it that are um, puzzling to them um, with all that information. So I think we have some questions in the chat box, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, you're in the chat. Okay. Where's the get to? Okay. Could you respond to questions after your talk? Please ask your questions through the chat panel. So if anybody has more questions, please put them into the chat box. Um, we've got some here. Okay, we'll, oh dear. Have a Xanatib be used only for PNAP patients when it becomes available? 
Um, I'm so sorry, uh, Barbara, can you repeat the question again? Will cabozantinib, my yes. second question, be used only for PNAP patients when it oh. becomes available? Oh, uh, great question. Um, so cabozantinib is uh, and just a little bit of a background because I just came from uh, the ESMO meeting, which is one of the big, the biggest medical oncology conference in, in Europe. And Dr. Jennifer Chan, who is the PI of the study, presented the data there. And, uh, and it's all for pancreas, but as well for extra pancreatic, meaning for long neuroendocrine tumors, as well as for small bowel neuroendocrine tumors. So, and, it, and it's good because now we have another tool for small bowel and, and as well for long neuroendocrine tumors. So it's not only for pancreas, it's also for long as well as for small bowel neuroendocrine tumors. And the data sounds quite exciting. And um, it does something that it could, another tool in our toolbox. And again, we, uh, my understanding is that Dr. Simron had it opened and um, uh, where he works, but that said, we're hoping that that can also be available in Canada too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Delicious <laughs> Simrolo is only available to net patients in Canada who have insurance. So if one has diarrhea, even though on, on somostatin analogs and no access to, to telistratat, what do you suggest to help with diarrhea? Yeah, yeah, very good question. And um, and yes, I mean, I'm, I'm, I can say that I'm sorry for sometimes, you know, the, you know, the, it, that some of these medications may not be available. But I know that uh, people in Canada are working to to have that in their formulary. Uh, but if the lottery study is not available, like I mentioned earlier, uh, one thing that we can do is is shorten the period of the monthly injection of either Landriotai or um, sandostatin. So instead of four weeks, maybe three weeks. I know that sometimes insurance may have some issues approving it, but as long as we have a, a good um, indication, I think it should get approved. Uh, other options are loperamide too. Um, that's an anti-diarrhea medications. I remember when I was practicing as well in, in New York City, and sometimes I use it here as well, is tincture of opium. It's, a, it's very, very, very old. Um, and sometimes that helps for those patients with severe diarrhea. Um, and that should be available in Canada because it's very, very old. And that's something that we could recommend. Uh, but uh, and but again, as we discussed earlier, those are some of the therapies for symptom control, but it's important that we also evaluate uh, your disease too and how many tumors you have because as I say systemic therapies can also play a very important role as well even surgery as we discussed or doing ablation embolization sometimes patients that have ablation embolization when we have a patient with a carcinoid syndrome and their liver metastasis when ablation or embolization is done the symptoms really improve dramatically as well I think there is a lot of tools that we can use not necessarily the medications for symptom control, but also the treatments that we have as well for systemic therapy, surgery, liver ablation. I think those are all options as well. But it's important to discuss that with your treating physician and see what makes the most sense and also discuss with a multidisciplinary team just to see what the options are. And I think, as I say, in Canada, you have excellent surgeons as well and you have excellent interventional radiologists too. And I think that that's something that you can discuss with all, all, all the other specialties as well. Right, okay, thank you. Um, what about the, okay, I can't read it positive. I have under 1.0 of cortisol, I get tested off and it won't move up. Uh, the glands on my kidneys have very small spots, but I've been told they're too small to surgically remove. I've had four major surgeries since 2020. The monthly injections help, but not 100%. Great improvement. I have grade three metastatic net. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Um, can Barbara, can I ask a question? Um, so there is something about cortisol. Maybe we can. It seems like there is two questions. Maybe we can address the first one about cortisol and then the second one. So maybe maybe that will be easier. Uh, there is something about cortisol. Yes. Um, so it's under one point zero cortisol. Um, it gets tested often, but it won't move up. It's basically what the question. But she's okay. coming, he or oh. she's coming. And then the second one is about uh, what therapies um, 
and then it's not helping is that right the, um, gland, the kidneys have small spots but they've been she, the person's being told they're too small to surgically remove mm -hmm. what therapy so, what therapies and the injections are helping but not 100 percent right With grade three oh. test yeah yeah um so um and again i mean i think one of the things just to make sure i mean this is uh, not a medical advice and what we're saying here but that said we always like to provide education and guidance and if uh, if your question is no answer or you still have more questions you have my email and please don't hesitate to reach out and just tell me about who you are and i'm happy to answer more questions more in detail and more on a personal level uh, but it seems that based on what i understand it seems that um you have these neuroendocrine tumors and the, the maybe when you say cortisol and the cortisol is low maybe they trying to test whether the neuroendocrine tumor produces cortisol and it's, it it maybe it doesn't uh but that said you know i think i will need more information to provide any education and guidance uh but it's also say that you have something in the kidney or some tumor in the kidney so i wonder if maybe you have a uh a a, a kidney neuroendocrine tumors those are rare but they we have patients as well and we have treat patients that have a kidney neuroendocrine tumors um and it's important to know whenever we provide and this is an overall in terms of management and guidance uh, of neuroendocrine tumors um like i say it's important to know different factors one factor is to know uh where the tumors are located in the neuroendocrine tumor, whether it's in the liver or it's in the liver and outside the, as the liver as well, how much tumor it is, uh, and in terms of the whole context of neuroendocrine tumors, whether they express a somatostatin receptor or not, uh, whether they're functional or not, but also we need to understand what is the growth rate in order to provide therapies or guide and what therapies we think may be best. Um, and if we feel that your tumor is slowly growing and it's very small, uh, minimal, um, so in those situations, I think somatostatin agonist is what we recommend. And maybe it's not stopping completely, but I do think it's a slowing the growth of tumors. And maybe no intervention needs to be done at that time, and that's okay. No intervention, it doesn't mean that we're not doing anything. We're just trying to understand more about the biology to then uh, provide an intervention. And yes, it seems that they're very small to do any surgical intervention, which is completely under, you know, that's what we do in, in patients when they have very, very low tumors, low volume, that's how we would say, and very small tumors. We try to observe those tumors, especially if they're slow growing, and the injections help to slow it down. I'm not saying they will stop completely, but they help to slow it down until we can provide any intervention based on the growth. I hope that answered your question, but if that did not answer your question, please, you have my email and I'm happy to answer more questions at a personal level. Thank you. Could you explain more about mesenteric fibrosis in patients with carcinoid syndrome? Would this cause pain and or bloating? Yep. Um, yep. Would Enteric fibrosis prohibits surgeries in the abdomen. Yeah, yeah, excellent question. Um, so yes, centric fibrosis we call that because it's kind of like a scar tissue that can be in the lining of the stomach, and that can scar tissue can prompt a patient to develop a bowel obstruction, and that's important to also. Uh, recognize that it can cause pain and also it can and that's important whenever you have pain and uh and you no know, passing gas so it's important that you discuss you know with your uh, treating physician as well um sometimes just just to let you know as well uh it's important that if you're getting treatment with luthotherapy it's important that you know your physician know because sometimes uh it can worsen the situation because what happened is that this hormone it can cause like scar tissue in a layer i mean i hope i'm saying it correctly but a layer outside we call that desmoplastic changes and it's because of this excess of hormones and that's what it caused a lot of symptoms of uh, pain and, and bowel obstruction and so forth sometimes surgery it can be indicated in those patients to prevent further complications. Sometimes in patients receiving luthothera, sometimes we have to give a, like a short course of steroids in order to minimize any complications to that. But yes, I think it's important that it's 
recognize, it's important that we treat it, it's important that surgery sometimes may be indicated in those patients to prevent complications. Sometimes this, uh, this uh, fibrosis can also bleed as well, and that's something that we need to acknowledge and recognize and treat it as well accordingly. Okay. Why do small bowel nets so often spread to the liver? Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. I don't think we know the answer to that. We know that neuroendocrine tumors likes to go to the liver. And, and, and small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, when they go to the liver is when the patient has the symptoms. When it's localized in the small bowel, sometimes they don't cause any symptoms. And sometimes we diagnose those incidentally via colonoscopy or endoscopy. Uh, but when they are in the liver, that's when they cause the symptoms related to carcinoid syndrome. Um, and um, yes, that's an excellent question. I think they, they like, and not just for neuroendocrine tumors, there are other tumors as well that they like to go to the liver because it's a very vascular type of organ and that's where the tumors feed. The tum they feed from these vessels and I, the liver is one of them. Whether it's one, but specifically neuroendocrine tumors likes to go to the liver. And sometimes we only have liver uh, tumors in no other places. And that's why sometimes the liver-directed therapies like ablation embolization sometimes can be recommended as well, or even surgery. So it's, uh, it's important that you have a good surgeon that is an expert in neuroendocrine tumors. And the reason why I'm saying that is because it's, a, it's very different than uh, a liver lesion related to colon cancer or another cancer, because the tumors uh, um, related to neuroendocrine tumor, when they go to the liver, they kind of like push the wall of the liver. So it's not like they don't have like these tentacles that is very vascular. They kind of like push the wall of the liver and it's easier for the surgeon like to scoop them out. So, and that's why it's important. And, and with that, you preserve as much as healthy liver as possible. So that's the reason why it's important that if a surgery, surgeon sees it's a, it's a surgeon that has expertise in neuroendocrine tumors. Because if a surgeon doesn't have expertise in neuroendocrine tumors, we treat it like colon cancer and they can chop a big, uh, you know, chunk of liver with healthy liver as well. So that's the reason why it's important to know a surgeon that can also uh, do the best surgery and, and also preserve as much as healthy liver as possible as well. Um, and, uh, but yes, that's a good question. I don't think I can, uh, why they like to go to the liver. That's something that we wanna understand here at the NIH. We also do a lot of research. Um, and we, every patient that comes here and, and we do surgery, we collect a small piece of tissue and we study and we do research with that. And my surgeon, Dr. Jonathan Hernandez, he's my net surgeon here. Um, he has, he, that's one of his questions. He wants to understand why, you know, different cancers, they like to go to the liver. But I think one of the reasons is because it's a very vascular uh, organ, like I say, these tumors. Uh, they like to, you know, feed from those vessels as well. Okay. We have a couple more questions here if we have time still. Um, mm -hmm. All these side effects terrify me. How long do these last? I know it will vary, but do we ever come to a place of subnormality? Uh, of side effect off? Uh, did, uh, did, I don't know if there is any... Um, the person who wrote the question, does she mention which medicine of, she's saying about side effects? No, I think, the, well, I don't know if she meant side effects, and he or she side effects in terms of um, all the things that can happen to you as opposed to the side effects of the drugs. It's not clear, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, I'm so sorry, Barbara. Um, can you repeat again the question? Okay, um, all these side effects, and yeah, you're right. I'm not sure the side effects of the uh, drugs. I was interpreting it as all these um, symptoms uh, terrifying me. How long do these last? I know it will vary, but do we ever come to a place of some normality? Um, okay, hmm. okay, so maybe I can answer this in different ways. And again, if, if, if the answer wasn't, um, if you need more clarification, like I say, please feel free to email me. Um, but it seems like, I mean, symptoms related to the neuroendocrine tumors. Yes, so we have symptoms related to the hormone excess that we need to treat. Uh, and if we give the appropriate therapy, those symptoms usually 
uh, results. Like for example, I have I see patients with insulinomas, um, so and 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 advanced insulinoma, meaning when they are metastatic in different places in the body. Um, and dioxazide is a very good medication that helps to re normalize the blood glucose to the point that patient can feel back to normal and not having the symptoms related to uh, to the uh, high, the low blood glucose. Um, like I said, symptoms related to the hormone excess as long as it's treated correctly. And, and like I said, we have different tools depending on what hormone it, it is um, produced. It can definitely help uh, and improve quality of life. The same with systemic therapy. Systemic therapy can also help control the growth of tumors and control the symptoms. And, and that can also help. And, and a lot of these therapies are well tolerated. The ones that I mentioned earlier, uh, like Verolimus, like um, um, Kipsidic and Temasolam, I, I mean, it's, it's fairly well tolerated. I think it's important in as a medical oncologist, whenever we give a, a, give a medication, we also want to make sure that you also live your best quality of life with the medications and the tools that we have. And if we need to reduce the dose in order to kind of help you with the side effects, yes. So I think two things, like I said, one is the symptoms related to the uh, neuroendocrine tumors and their tools that we can use in order to control the hormone access. And yes, your quality of life should improve. And then we have the side effects related to the different therapies. Um, and, and, and a lot of the uh, drugs that I discussed, like Landritiosantostatin, Landritiosantostatin, they're fairly well tolerated. Um, I think that the most common side effects uh, of the related to these injections are it can be bloating, it can also be diarrhea. So that's that's something that um, you may say. So you're giving me these injections to help me with my diarrhea, but in some patients when they don't have this excess of hormone, as we discussed, majority are non-functional. It can cause diarrhea because it's inhibit some of the hormones in the gut, and that can cause diarrhea. So usually that gets better over time, but there are medications as well to control the diarrhea related to the somatostatin agonist, either Landry or Sandostatin. It can sometimes cause blood in his, um, you know, pain, uh, but that usually gets better over time. Goldstone is another one. So that's the reason why if a patient with neuroendocrine tumor uh, needs to have surgery, so they usually remove the goldstone as well, the gallbladder as well, because of the goldstone associated with these injections. Um, and um, and we have also Lutathera, it's very well tolerated as well, like the injections were very well tolerated, Lutathera is, is fairly well tolerated as well. Um, and um, so usually some of the side effects and the immediate side effects is the amino acid that is given to, with the infusion of Lutathera. But again, we have medicines to also minimize some of the side effects. In terms of the other therapies like Everolimus, Cabosantinib, or the chemotherapy that we said, you know, I think as a medical oncologist, whenever we make a recommendation, we want you to live your best quality of life and we make adjustments based on that. We sometimes lower the dose. And by lowering the dose, it doesn't mean that the efficacy will be less. It's just that we need to make sure even patients with much lower, lower dose, they still have the same efficacy. We just want to make sure that we minimize any of the side effects. So I hope that answered your question, but again, I'm here uh, via, via email, reach out if you have any more questions. Okay. Um, for net patients with severe um, itch or rash, what blood tests may be appropriate? For net patient that has severe... Uh, In rash, yeah. A rash. Well, I think it's important to know what kind of rash is, and that's one of the things that I usually like to um, uh, discuss with a dermatologist because dermatologists they can definitely help me to understand, you know, what rash is. Um, if this is a rash related to glaucoma, it's very specific type of rash. is is uh, is very specific, and it can be very itchy as well, and it's, it's in the whole body. Um, and usually in those situations, like I say, fatty acids can help with that, but that's glucagonoma is very rare. And in those situations, we check for the glucagon levels too, but that's a very specific type of rash. Um, and um, there may be other reasons why you may have rash. It can also be other medications that you may take. I think it's important that whenever you have a rash to discuss with your uh, 
care, care provider and also have at least some medications that you're taking because it may not necessarily be the neuroendocrine tumors, maybe other causes as well that may cause that. It can also be the detergent that you're using at home and or and or the type of material that you wear as well. So I think it's important to see a dermatologist who can help differentiate what kind of rash it is because they're the experts and then based on that to make the changes necessary. So are you applying that also to um, the comment was about an itch as well as a rash? Mm. I don't know I'm, if there's a difference. I'm sorry, say that again, Barbara. She also said about having um, an itch and um, which yeah. may or not, may not have a rash associated. Exactly. With. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yes, it can also be yeah itchiness. I mean, it can it can also be dry skin too. That can cause a lot of. Uh, but the beginning, I think it's important to uh, see a dermatologist who can help that. In terms of a rash specific or itchiness related to neuroendocrine tumors, like I say, I mean, it's Bukawunam is one of them. But it's very characteristic. It's not some like we usually know more or less uh, what it is. But um, at least. I know because I've seen it, but uh, but yes, I think it's important to discuss that with your dermatologist. And each of us can be just dry skin, or like again, the detergent that you use, or I mean, it could be other factors and may not be necessarily near endocrine tumors. But that safe medications as well can do that. Okay, last question: um, Are there any studies on treatment for those with Lynch syndrome? This is my fifth cancer in 28 years. Mm -hmm. I don't Yes, yes. Um, Lynch syndrome. So yes, I mean this is a is Lynch syndrome is a series of cancers associated with Lynch syndrome, um, and um, and here at the NIH we do have a longitudinal study that for Lynch syndrome and that usually follow patients over time, and understand you know what tumors those patients may develop and understand between families too because we know that this is Lynch syndrome is hereditary. Um, and um, and there's a 50% chance that um, that you're off, off, you know, like your kids may have also um, Lynch syndrome. So and I, there is a study that trying to understand as well the presentation in the family may be different as well. I think one of the questions that I sometimes get is like I have men one or I have Lynch syndrome or I have luframiny uh, because I also see uh, adrenocortical carcinoma. And some of the questions is like, okay, so if my a daughter or son may have the same tumors that I have, and it's, we don't know, we don't understand. So it's, we call that phenotype genotype, meaning that based on the gene that they have, they can have a very specific tumor presentation, and we don't see a correlation um, on 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 that. Uh, but that said, you know, we're trying to understand. At the NIH, they have a study that trying to understand longer term about the appearance uh, occurrence of tumors and also in families whether it's different and why it's different and so forth uh, but yes as you know with Lynch syndrome you need to have a long life screening of different type of cancer I'm happy to answer any questions after this okay well that's our questions for today and I think we've gone over our time as well so thank you very very much for sharing all of your information with us and that you're willing to uh, either email or talk with people afterwards, that's a real bonus for us. So thank you again very, very much. Um, we have thank to see you. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And any questions, please reach out. I'm here to help you. Thank, thank you. you. Okay.